Okay, good morning. Um, when Rob asked me to give this presentation, he asked me to give it with a view to collaboration. So I'm going to kind of give a whistle-stop tour of everything that we're working on, but not get into any particular detail, but we can, we can discuss detail um, if anybody wants. I, I thought I'd just give a, a wee background about the James Hutton Institute first, just a couple of slides. Um, I'm based in Dundee. Um, but the, the James Hutton Institute has sites all across um, Scotland focusing on different areas of research, but most of the crop research is done in Invergowrie and Dundee, where I'm based. And the way that our, our structure, we're kind of structured as a kind of matrix system. So we all sit within a science group, and we have these five science groups, cell and molecular sciences, environmental and biochemical sciences, the ecological sciences, and then the information and computing science, and then we have social, economic and geographical sciences. So that's our science group. So we all, as I say, I sit within CMS. And then we have a, a theme structure. So the science group's supposed to be kind of the quality of research, and the theme structure's supposed to be making sure that research goes somewhere, so that it's not just funded um, for the sake of writing a paper, and that's the end of the story. It has to kind of feed out um, into, um, certainly if it's Scottish government funded, it has to feed out into end users. So my research feeds through a couple of themes, the enhancing crop productivity and utilisation, and then the controlling weeds, pests, and diseases. And the structure is a very fluid structure, because as the Institute kind of remit changes, the theme structure will change. But this is, this is how it sits at the moment. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about is the work that we do in raspberry and blueberry with, as I say, with a view to establishing collaboration. So most of my research has been <laughs> linking the phenotype to the, the genetics. So how the plant behaves, looks, smells, tastes to genetic regions so that we can then understand why the plant does what it does. And as part of my theme delivery, everything that we do or a large part of the research feeds into the UK Raspberry Breeding um, Consortium funded programme. And this is just a list of kind of the traits that we're interested in from a breeding perspective, but also some of them very much from a science perspective. So it's all the stuff that you would expect because it's a fresh fruit. So it's going to be things like colour to, to encourage people to buy it, the way it looks, tastes, so that people will want to keep buying it. Um, it's got to be or have resistance to pests and diseases. Um, physical traits that make it easy to, to grow or pick and very much nowadays is sustainability traits and yield. So these are all the areas that we are focusing on. And our strategy has been to have um, one reference population, which is the Latham by Glen Moy population, and then to have other populations for specific um, traits. But we have a second kind of reference population, an autumn treasure by Glen Fine population. So all of our raspberry work has kind of focused around these populations. So we have these populations replicated at a number of sites and on grower farms. We have them both as open crops and also under tunnel. And we have the linkage maps, the kind of genetic maps, the kind of pictures, if you like, of the chromosomes that go along with these populations. So our kind of philosophy has been that if we can measure it somehow, then we can map it, we can place it onto the genetic linkage map. Once it's on the genetic linkage map, we can pull out back clones that effectively have the, the, the DNA sequence that's important to whatever trait that we're interested in. So I'm just going to run through some examples of the work that we've done, and then where I've underlined it's kind of what we're currently focusing on in these particular areas. So root rot resistance was one of our um, big projects when we started with the Moy Latham population. It was one of the motivations for using Latham as our reference population because it has resistance or tolerance to root rot and it, it never, it's never overcome. And you can see the, the kind of plants, there's Latham on the left 
and Glen Moy on the right, and you can see just the difference in root structure after they've been infected with um, Phytophthora. So by growing these in infested sites and doing glass house trials and whatever, we were able to um, map the resistance to two QTLs. And from that, we could then sequence back clones that told us basically what was in those regions. And the, what we're, we're working on at the moment is on the resistance mechanisms. How does Latham actually manage to withstand root rot? And we're, we're kind of using a combination of approaches. So we've sequenced Glen Moy genome, we're sequencing the Latham genome, and we're sequencing the Phytophthora genome so that we can actually look at what happens when um, the pathogen infects a resistant or a susceptible um, genotype. So that's our kind of mapping root rot. And it applies to any other kind of diseases or pests that we're interested in. So as if we can measure and map resistance, we've been doing the same kind of things. Um, so, so for example, cane splitting. Um, we, we, we mapped cane splitting, but what we wanted to do is look at Autumn Treasure in particular, which has come out of the smalling program, because Autumn Treasure can heal splits. So we made the Autumn Treasure by Glen Fine population for, for kind of two reasons. One, because it can heal um, splits, and secondly, because it was a prime cane cross by a main season so that we could look at kind of season juvenility and all these kind of issues. So that's another area that's, that's very much ongoing, that mostly the cane splitting work now in the treasure fine population. Another um, area that we've been looking at is physical traits. And by physical traits, we kind of mean anything like it could be bush density. Um, this is an example of leaf hairs on the, the, the plant. So again, we know that um, leaf hairs or bush density or whatever can have an impact on pests and diseases. So for example, um, if you have a, a plant that has more um, leaf hairs on it, it's going to have more aphids. So by kind of understanding the genetics behind a lot of these traits and then using them in the breeding program, we can come up with kind of physical, if you like, resistance traits that are, are nothing to do with kind of chemical-based resistance. So that's another big area that we are working on. And as an institute, Integrated pest disease and weed management is, is becoming one of our um, bigger themes, if you like. But at the moment, well, until recently, it hasn't really taken the genetic component of that into account. So at the moment, we're, we're in a lot of discussions with how geneticists like me can work with ecologists and people interested in integrated pest and disease management to, again, support um, sustainability. Um, a new area for us um, is looking at um, imaging to um, try and characterise stresses in plants. And this um, image just shows you um, the, these are actually replicates from the Moy Latham population that have been either under drought stress or normal treatment. And you can see that the bottom one's the drought stress where all the, the kind of highlighted bits. So we're, we're trying to use these imaging techniques to see if we can get an early handle on when the plant stressed and how it's stressed and, and what it actually means in real terms for things like yield and quality. So um, again, these are just some of the images we've been taking over the last um, year. So for example, a lot of these things measure stomatal closure. So if the stomata are closed, you're getting reduced photosynthesis, so you're getting reduced growth and yield. So it's basically how the stresses are all impacting on the plant and using imaging to get early kind of warning systems for that. And we're looking at all sorts of things like can we, can we see like attack by vine weevil or phytophthora or water stress or whatever on these plants using these imaging techniques. And then kind of colour, uh, sorry, then we come on to the kind of quality aspect. So that was all kind of mostly pests and disease and physical traits, but obviously quality is incredibly important. So again, our philosophy, if we can measure it, we can map it and understand it. So this is just an example where we've looked at fruit colour and we've managed to identify the regions on the linkage groups that are responsible. And often we've managed to get down to the genes that are having an effect. So this kind of wee green box just shows you a flavanol synthase gene. 
and the, the table shows you different measures for colour, so Y is just a measure that comes off the colour meter or a visual assessment. And you can see, depending on which allele combination of the flavanol synthase unit has, it has a big significant impact on colour. And that's a simple marker that can be used for, for colour. Um, another area that we're working on at the moment, in fact, we've been working on it for years and years, but every year the statisticians keep saying, could we have one more year of data, please? <laughs> Just another one. So we've been measuring censoring compositional analysis in the Moylathan population for years and years and years um, so that we could build this flavour model. And we're getting to the stage where we are managing to build the flavour model. Um, it's kind of a bit of a no-brainer that sugars and acids are kind of key in this model. But there are also volatiles that, that come into the model. Um, so, as I say, this is a bit of a work in progress as well. And it would be nice to do this kind of thing on other populations as well that have slightly different kind of taste characteristics. Shelf life and softening, again, we've been working for years on trying to characterise um, softening because obviously softening is a big issue and depending on season it can be particularly um, bad so again over the last few years we have mapped um, fruit softening measuring it by either a texture analyzer or a kind of breeder squish test to see how soft something is and they actually tie up completely so that what, what the breeder is telling is about how soft is, is the same as what the instrument is telling is about how soft so again, we've mapped it um, and we've looked at gene expression to kind of confirm almost that the, the genes that we've identified through QTL mapping are the genes that are differentially expressed between um, the parents of the population. Um, and again, we're building up a, a picture and developing markers that can feed into the breeding programme for um, fruit softening. Um, ripening, this is kind of my pet project, <laughs> um, we've been working on what controls ripening because obviously season's incredibly important and particularly in Scotland um, where we have a slightly different season we've been trying to really understand what controls um, basically all the timings right across the whole ripening period and Gene H is interesting, Gene H um, is actually a gene that's responsible for hairy canes, so whether the raspberry cane is pubescent or not. But it also, depending on the status of gene H, it gives resistance to cane diseases. But there was another interesting um, factor about the gene H was that it actually delayed ripening, and we couldn't understand how on earth this gene for cane hairs could have an effect on ripening. But when we actually sequenced across the region, we, we kind of scheduled four backs across the region and we came up with this werewolf gene that has actually been shown to regulate um, FT, which is a, a key floral regulator. So although it's not specifically gene H that's having the effect, um, it's a, a gene very close to it. Um, as I say, so we, we have been working on ripening and ripening is something that we'd like to look at more in the treasure fine population because it is a prime cane by a main season. And we're just kind of building up pictures of the genes that come in as important right across um, the developmental stages. And as I say, we're doing a similar sort of thing on the treasure fine population where we, we have a couple of years worth of kind of seasonal data on that. But what, I mean, what we realised quickly was that um, linkage, genetic linkage mapping is fantastic and back screening is fantastic as well. But the back screening is really, really time consuming and it's incredibly expensive. So what we wanted to do is find ways of looking at the bigger picture almost because traits are controlled by lots of different genes and also in response to environmental influences. So over the last few years, we've been building better tools, if you like, that we can um, more um, easily, if you like, study the traits that we're interested in. So we've been basically sequencing the raspberry genome. Um, we've been making a, a, a high resolution genotyping by sequencing map so that we have thousands of markers on it. Um, we've been linking the genome sequence to that map to have a physical map. And we've been kind of generating all the kind of um, 
transcriptomics technology for the, the microarrays. So we've developed microarrays and also metabolomics um, from right across the, the kind of ripening period so that we have a lot of resources that can help us look at the bigger picture. Um, and this is just a picture of the genome browser. Um, so what you can do with this is, so this is the Glen Moy genome. So what you can either do is search for a specific gene or you can blast a sequence or whatever and that comes up with a scaffold linked to the map that can tell you what genes are there. So I mean this, is, this has actually been fantastic for us. Um, it, it's really moved things along much quicker than having to pull out a back and sequence the back and whatever. So um, having the, the genome browser has been really, really useful. The genotyping by sequence and then again having a, a, a much higher resolution map has been really, really useful. And the fact that we can link the GBIS to the, the genome browser is really, really helpful. And what we've also done is um, basically put um, something like 60,000 transcripts onto the genome browser as well from 22 different raspberry varieties so that we could find out where all the kind of gene-based SNPs are. Sorry. So this is our kind of ultimate aim is to develop this sort of high throughput breeding tool but also a research tool because if we have all these things linked then we can much more easily look at the traits that we're interested in. So we're kind of three quarters of the way through here. We've got the, 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 the new linkage map, we've got the genome, we've got the, the kind of transcripts but what we're trying to do is work out how, how best to provide this to a breeding programme, how, how are they going to be able to use this in the easiest possible way. So that's kind of raspberry. Um, so what I'll do now is talk a wee bit about blueberry because just about everything we've done on raspberry we're trying to do in blueberry. Obviously blueberry is tetraploid so it's a bit more difficult um, but it's, it's a, a crop, it's, it's greatly emerging, um, particularly in Scotland where root rot is a major issue for the raspberry industry. A lot of growers are putting blueberries in, or cherries, but mo mostly blueberries at the moment. So they, they kind of need a research base to help them um, develop the industry. So basically what we've been doing over the last five or six years is developing knowledge basically of kind of crop characteristics of the cultivars that are grown across the UK. We've been looking at what consumers actually want from a blueberry. And I think the bottom line is they don't really know <laughs> from all the sensory and compositional analysis. Um, we've been looking at how we can get a competitive advantage over imported fruit, because I think it's still something like 95% of blueberries are imported. I'm looking at Richard, because he'll, he'll know that. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's largely imported. And, um, Basically, if we are serious about being able to help the industry with this crop, then we need the research base, which includes the genetics, to be able to support and sustain the industry. And encourage, basically encourage growers to put the, this crop in, which is a long-term crop. So what, what we did in five years was look at a whole range of stuff. So yield, visual fruit quality, growth habits, season, pests and diseases establishment and basically um, all the consumer profiling, the, the kind of flavour analysis. Um, we developed a population which actually isn't very good in the UK. We, well, we didn't develop it. We got it from Michigan. It's a Draper dual population, um, two varieties that are, are kind of quite different. But it isn't particularly suited to the UK conditions. It doesn't do particularly well here. So, um, so although we've done a lot of linkage mapping and some really preliminary QTL analysis on it, we've decided to almost start again with a population that's more suited to the UK. Um, because one of the big things we, we, we've been trying to tackle is yield. And this is just data from, this is a, from a Scottish grower with um, different varieties. And um, you can see the, the yield across a number of seasons, the variability in that is incredible. Um, so trying to you know, have a profitable business where in 2000, if you look at Darrow in 2011, the yield was virtually nothing. 
Um, whereas in 2010, I think you were getting what five tons per hectare. It's an incredible difference. So what we've been trying to do is, is basically understand what's controlling this variation in yield. And to do that, we've been um, looking at varieties that are already there, but we've also been developing new populations that we think will be more suited to the UK. And they're also forming the basis of a kind of UK breeding program that's been um, kind of underwritten by our, our commercial arm. The, the, the James Hutton Institute has a couple of commercial arms, one of which is concerned with crops. So at the moment, our commercial arm is underwriting the, the blueberry breeding program, but we're kind of piggybacking onto that to make um, populations that are, are much more suitable um, for the UK conditions. So um, future, I guess, um, partly that's what today is about, where we can actually have a discussion on you know, what, what we can actually do as, as two research organisations. Because I was talking to Rob earlier, and um, I, I think there's an incredible scope through things like TSB to bring in um, money into the fruit industry. My view is, if the money's there, it may as well come into fruit. So um, if there are areas that we can work on, and there are definitely are areas that we can collaborate on, because th there are definitely weaknesses at the Hutton that we haven't filled in. There is lack of pathologists, um, a lack of people with expertise on integrated pest disease and weed management. So there are, there are lots of areas. We have enormous genetic resources that we are willing to share. Um, so um, if there are any questions, any areas that you want me to talk about in more detail, um, I am more than happy and I'm here for most of the day. So thank you very much.